Hi, everyone. I'm Zach Robinson, and I'm a program officer at Open Philanthropy. And I'll be the MC for this Q&A session with Holden Karnofsky. As Chief Executive Officer, Holden sets the strategy and oversees the work of Open Philanthropy, which identifies outstanding giving opportunities and grants hundreds of millions of dollars each year. And Holden graduated from Harvard University in 2003 with a degree in social studies and spent the next several years in the hedge fund industry before co-founding GiveWell in 2007. He began co-developing Open Philanthropy, which was initially called GiveWell Labs in 2011. Welcome to EA Global, Holden. Thanks. Um, so today for the audience, part of our conversation will be inspired by questions from all of you. Some of them were posted and voted on from the EA forum and some of them are coming in live now. For our audience, if you'd like to submit a question, you can submit it via the chat box to the right of the video. Holden, so I, I wanna get to some of these audience questions in a moment, but I was first hoping you could help give us a little bit of background on how OpenPhil operates. I think many people who identify with effective altruism have likely heard about OpenPhil, but OpenPhil does a variety of different things. Could you take a moment to talk us through what are the different parts of Open Philanthropy as an organization and how those different parts fit together? Yeah, so thanks for having me. Um, Open Philanthropy, in a nutshell, we basically work with very high net worth uh, people, especially Carrie Tuna and Dustin Moskovitz. Um, and we, our job is to basically make recommendations for where to give money away to do as much good as possible. Um, and so in terms of how we're structured and in terms of the pieces that contribute to that, um, you can sort of think of it uh, as it, there, there's a bunch of, of different questions you need to answer in order to give away money as well as possible. And one of the ones that we work on, one of the questions we work on that I think is a bigger focus at Open Philanthropy than other foundations is which problems should we be working on in the first place? What causes should we be working on? Um, how big should the budget be for each different area that we're in? And so a cause might be something like criminal justice reform or farm animal welfare or potential risks from advanced AI. Um, and you know, in a lot of foundations, it's typical to kind of set these in the charter of the foundation um, and then try to, try to be as rational as you can be within that. And in open philanthropy, we have a lot of work going into how big the budget is for each cause and what causes we want to be in at all. Um, there's kind of two different components of that. So there's explicit cause prioritization analysis. Uh, that's basically where we try to look at different causes we could do funding in. And uh, at a high level, at a heuristic level, when deciding whether to enter, we might ask whether a cause is important, neglected, and tractable. Um, and that kind of gives us a guideline to which causes we want to go into. But we also try to estimate how much good we can accomplish per dollar if we grow the budget of a cause or if we shrink the budget of a cause. So that is cause prioritization work. Um, that work is uh, often comes down to really tough questions uh, about things like, what is the value of helping animals versus helping humans? Or what is the value of uh, increasing or reducing existential risk uh, and improving the value of the very long run future versus helping people in somewhat more straightforward ways today. And so we have uh, people who do work on what's called a worldview investigations function, where we take some of the most crucial deep beliefs, crucial deep worldview judgments underlying our cause prioritization, and we research those and we try to make them make our views rigorous and written down and usually public um, and invite feedback on them. And so something that we've recently been working on, uh, for example, is trying to form a really calibrated picture of when transformative AI might be developed because that colors a lot of our views about how tractable it is to do things that might influence the long run future of humanity. So we have worldview investigations, we have cause prioritization, uh, and those two things kind of feed into how big the budgets are in each cause. Um, and then once we're in causes, we have grant investigations. So we have, you know, usually the role is called program officer. And those are people who they'll be in a cause like farm animal welfare or effective altruism community building or biosecurity. And their job is to kind of get to know the people in the field, get to know the literature, uh, understand what they could be doing to use money to do good. And then they are the ones who lead the way on making the grants. And then they make the recommendation for where the grants go and they'll generally have teams. So there'll be teams working on each cause. Uh, and then once we have a recommendation, we need to do the rest of the work to make the grant. And that's often a lot of work. Um, you know, so some grants are simple. You just write a check. Some of them we're working with a university or we're working internationally or we're doing something else where there's 
complexity um, to kind of getting our money to a grantee and getting the terms all squared away. And that's where our grants management team comes in. And then we also have our um, operations team that supports the organization in a lot of ways so that we can do our best work across the board. Uh, we have communications team um, and we have, you know, we have other functions. We have um, evaluation work on understanding what our impact has been to date, which also feeds into cause prioritization. But the, the real basic pillars, you know, it's, it's worldview investigations, examining the, the key fundamental beliefs. It's cause prioritization, looking at how much money is in each cause. Um, it's the program officer work of making grant recommendations. And then it's the grants management work of, of making those grants. Great, thanks for that explanation, Holden. I want to return to a specific part of that sort of prioritization process you were talking about and talk a little bit about budgets. One of the most upvoted questions for you on the EA form related to the amount OpenFill spends in different causes. I think people are interested in knowing a little bit more about how OpenFill sets its funding priorities. And I, I want to try and break this question out in Chung. So maybe just to begin with, could you describe what OpenFill's biggest cause areas currently are? Yeah, um, in, in terms of what we currently do, our biggest single area every year tends to be uh, just recommending donations to GiveWell's top charities. Uh, that that has been in the range of $100 million a year. Uh, there's just, there's a lot of room to give money there uh, at a very high rate of return. So in, in terms of doing a lot of good per dollar. Um, other cause areas, you know, we tend to be, we tend to set a budget that's somewhere between 20 and $50 million per year when we enter a cause, or, or rather sometimes we start smaller, but we ramp up to that fairly quickly. Um, and that has just generally come from when we enter a cause and we're still getting to know it, we want to be a major player in it. We want the ability to have top talent um, giving out the money, uh, be able to you know, have just like a lot of chances to experiment and try things. And that's kind of the number we've settled on there. Um, so it tends to be 20 to $50 million a year per cause for things like criminal justice reform, farm animal welfare, biosecurity and pandemic preparedness, um, you know, effective altruism, community building, potential risk for advanced AI. Those are all generally in those range, um, in that range. And then, you know, over time, what we're trying to do is get more rigorous and quantitative about, uh, you know, saying, hey, we want to actually calculate uh, in, in a very approximate and rough way, but we want to have an idea of how much good we can do per dollar in different causes and set the budgets based on that. And so you, you know, in theory, what you want to do, and I think in practice, this gets a lot messier, but in theory, what you want to do is you want to grow the budget of a cause um, until, you know, until basically the next dollar in that cause would be worse than the next dollar in another cause. Um, and that's how you want to set the budgets. Uh, there was, I think, in, in the question you're mentioning, there was a, a little bit of a, I think, a, a potential misconception here. It's always tricky to look at our grants database uh, by calendar year because a lot of our biggest giving is happening kind of across the calendar year. So we do give well top charity grants at year end. Some of them land in December, some of them land in January. Um, and, and that December, January thing can, can be pretty confusing. Um, so, you know, our, our scientific research budget is $50 million a year and it tends to break down into a lot of different causes. So some of that science work is actually biosecurity and pandemic preparedness work, um, like developing antivirals. Um, some of that work is actually farm animal welfare work, like investing in, you know, in alternatives to animal products. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, it, it, it does a mix of things. Um, and so that's, that's a, the, a, kind of, a kind of a way you can misread that. But um, yeah, right now our, our give all top charities are, are definitely number one. Other things tend to be in the 20 to 50 range. And then we're looking to make things more rigorous over time. And I can, I can talk more later about the rigor and how that works because it can be very tricky to set those quantitative comparisons. Yeah, I, I'm actually interested in, a little bit in, in diving into to, to some of that sense of analytical rigor and, and figuring it out how it um, meshes, if you will, with other parts of the, the process in figuring out how much funding OpenFill will allocate to different areas. And in particular, I'd be curious if you could speak a little bit to how much of OpenFill's funding decisions are being set purely by research and cause prioritization, those sort of analytical methods, and how, how much of it is also driven by the availability of grant making opportunities. And you know, if we're looking at OpenFill's budgets over the course of a year, or maybe a little bit longer than a year, or a little bit something you know offset from a year, uh, uh, to your point there. Um, would the, the amount of funding look different if all of the opportunities that you or OpenFill wanted to fund actually existed? 
Oh yeah, I mean our so first off, I mean it's it's good to know in general that if you just tally up our dollars by budget or by cause, it's not necessarily going to tell you like how important we think the causes are. Um, first, because of what I said that we've often historically just entered a cause with with you know something in the twenty to fifty million dollar range, um, not because we calculated that was the optimal number, but because we get a lot of benefits from kind of being in that range. Um, and then yeah, I mean there there are big differences between causes in just shovel readiness, and you know this is one of the things that I think is a little bit surprises some people about philanthropy, but. Um, you know, we, we often, when we want to spend money and we want to spend it as much as possible and we want to get a certain amount of good accomplished per dollar, um, a lot of times we're just constrained because there aren't enough grantees and it varies a lot from cause to cause. So when you look at Give All Top Charities, they're doing things like distributing bed nets to prevent malaria and there's just, there's just a lot of room there. You can give a lot of money there um, today. And you know, in a lot of the other areas, we're actually we're under our eventual target spending um, because we haven't, you know, we just are still working on uh, building the teams, building the knowledge, building the understanding, um, and in some cases, building the fields uh, to just be able to spend the amount of money we want to spend and get the return that we want to get, get the good accomplished per dollar that we want to get. Um, so, you know, the most the most uh, intense place where this is an issue is in our long termist work. So a lot of our work is long-termist, which means that what we're basically trying to do is we're trying to give away money to reduce the odds of a global catastrophic risk or an existential risk, um, or more generally, you know, give away money to improve the long-run trajectory of the entire future of humanity. So you know, very, uh, very grandiose ambition there. You could sort of, you know, sometimes to help people understand what we're trying to do, I might say, you know this money is really targeted at things that could matter for 10,000 years or could matter for a million years, um, could flow through on that kind of time frame or longer. Um, and so that, you know, that, that puts you in a certain frame of mind and makes you work on certain things. And when I think about, you know, ways we could spend money today that could end up still mattering in kind of a predictable, stable way uh, for another 10,000 or a million or more years, um, you know, a lot of the things we're most interested in are just er the things we think are at the very top of that list are just areas that are not widely recognized um, as pressing social problems. And so, you know, the big ones, I mean, if I were to, if I were to talk about the two biggest areas where I think doing something today could affect uh, humanity for, you know, for a million plus years, um, one of them would be biosecurity and pandemic preparedness. Um, and there is certainly a, a large field uh, working on trying to prevent or respond to the next pandemic, However, you know, our interests tend to be focused on the very, very worst cases. And that, that often means thinking about uh, future pandemics that, that could be possible in the future that are not possible today if there is big advances in synthetic biology and if there are basically, you know, states trying to build bioweapons and making mistakes and leaking them. And these are, these are things we, won't, we, we hope won't happen. We're trying to reduce the odds. But when we think about risks like that, you know, we're thinking about pandemics that could kill a billion plus people. Um, and most of the biosecurity field is just not interested in that. They're just, you know, they're very focused on, they're very focused on things that are more likely, um, which is understandable. But that means that when we're, we're in that field, we're often kind of at cross purposes with people. And we're often kind of saying, you know, we'd love to fund work that addresses this kind of risk. And there's very few people out there um, who have both the qualifications, the background, um, who are ready to do work that's really going to matter, but who also share that goal and are going to do something that's going to matter for that goal. And then, you know, the other cause that that is really big that I think is is a good cause to be in if you're if you're trying to do something about the next million years is potential risk from advanced AI. Um, and people probably know that that's a that's a topic that different people look at very differently. And I wouldn't say there's a very well developed mature field of you know, looking at the kinds of AI risks that could matter for 10,000 or a million years or more. So there's a lot of our work that, um, you know, there's a lot of our work, and, and this applies in, on other areas too. This is not just long-termism, but those are examples of how sometimes we believe that if we, if we could find grantees who have the qualifications, the expertise, the background, who are ready to make a difference, but who also have that orientation and they're working on the right kind of goal, there could be a massive amount of good accomplished per dollar. Um, but if they're not there, we can't fund them yet. And that puts us in this interesting situation of needing to you know, see if we can build a field, see if uh, the supply of grantees grows over time and thinking about what we can do to grow the supply of grantees. And it does mean that our dollar spending now um, 
it's below our eventual target, that does not mean we're desperate to bring it up. It doesn't mean we're going to spend, like we certainly could spend more if we wanted. Um, but it, what it means is that we're, we're hoping that in the future, there's more giving opportunities than there are now. And it means that today's giving is not exactly in line with what it would be on kind of a purely theoretical basis. Yeah. Well, well you about, you know, maybe uh, growing the field of potential grantees in the future. You, you may have a few entrepreneurial EAs in the audience. And there were some questions from the forum um, about you and some of the ideas you might have about and do you have any high quality funding opportunities or project ideas that you might want OpenField to fund that don't currently exist? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of things we would love to fund um, if they existed. I, I should be clear that, you know, just because we want to fund something if it existed, it doesn't mean that, um, I, I think in a lot of these cases, it's like we would fund them if they were, if they had leadership that had certain, you know, qualifications and track record. It, it doesn't It doesn't mean that we're just sort of looking to fund whatever version of this we see. Um, but I could certainly rattle off a lot of things that we, you know, we wish existed. I mean, uh, so so GiveWell, I mean, starting with GiveWell's top charities, they have a number of things that they wish they could fund and expand um, if there were charities working on them. Just to, just to give one example uh, would be using an antiseptic chlorhexidine uh, to treat the umbilical cord stump uh, at scale. And, and that can reduce neonatal mortality, just like mortality of infants. Um, that's an example of something where if there were a charity that was just running around doing that, GiveWell well would be potentially looking at funding them. Um, there's other areas, you know, I, I mean, basically in any area you name, there's, there's stuff we wish we could fund that we're not funding. So in farm animal welfare, um, you know, I think, I think we're often kind of bottlenecked on animal welfare standards. So a lot of times we feel that if there were an agreed upon uh, set of standards that was kind of realistic and in touch with, um, you know, in touch with what's realistic about how uh, how companies are going to treat animals, um, and it was like concrete and it existed. That a lot of times there would be more effective advocacy because you could you could kind of put pressure on corporations to adopt that standard. Um, cage free is an example of something really simple. You can say you know chickens shouldn't be in cages; they should be in non cage systems. And we've supported a lot of groups that have advocated for that and gotten a lot of cage free pledges. But when you get to questions like you know, how should fish be treated prior to slaughter or during slaughter? Um, how should broiler chickens be treated? You know, a lot of times we end up wishing that we had, you know, more in the way of really well thought through and quickly developed standards that we could advocate around. And these standards do exist, but I think more progress on them would be awesome. Um, for biosecurity, you know, there's all sorts of things. I mean, we, we wish there was more attention to tracking and undermining and stigmatizing um, you know, any kind of like state sponsored research on bioweapons. It's it's banned by international law, but uh, you know, there, there may be some of it happening anyway. And we wish there was more attention on rooting it out and stigmatizing it and and reducing it. Um, so those are those are things uh, you know, on on potential risks for advanced AI. I mean, in general, we wish there were more kind of AI research agendas out there that had a compelling case for saying, you know, if we can solve this set of technical problems, we're going to be reducing risks from advanced AI. Um, you know, I think, I think we've also written about in scientific research, um, we would theoretically love to fund a think tank that was kind of advocating for ways the National Institutes of Health or the National Science Foundation could do their job differently um, in order to have science kind of be more effective and be more pro-social. So uh, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of things that we, you know, that we wish we could fund um, if, if there was like great leadership and someone really, really ready to get it done. Great, thanks for sharing those ideas. I, I wanna return for a moment back to the, the topic of budgets. And you've talked some a little bit about the process of evaluating different budgets, doing some research, how individual budgets are set. But I'm also wondering if you could share a bit with the audience about how we compare budgets across different kinds of causes. And in particular, you know, there are lots of different parts of the portfolio and you've written about this idea of worldview diversification before. Um, and I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about that approach. Yeah, so, so I've, I've talked a couple of times about uh, good accomplished per dollar and I'm, I'm gonna start just using the term ROI for that even though it's a little bit of a simplification, it's just easier to say. And, and we often use metrics that are kind of using an ROI format that's return on investment. So, so the idea is that, um, you know, if we if we spent a dollar, uh, we would like to there we would like that to create more than a dollar of value for the world. And often when we talk about ROI, we're talking about how many dollars of value did we create for the world per dollar that we spent. Um, 
And you know, we, we often try to kind of think in ROI terms and estimate ROIs and do whatever budget allocation is going to maximize ROI. Um, and so, just to give the you know the the real initial take on that is uh, when we you know when when you give to give directly, that's a charity that basically just gives cash to extremely poor families, uh, mostly in Africa. I think maybe all in Africa still. Um, and there's you know there's this kind of concept that uh, compared to giving out the cash to average Americans, uh, the money goes something like 100 times as far uh, when you give it out to give directly recipients because there's something like 100 times less, you know, they have 100 times less to begin with. Um, and if you use kind of these standard models of how valuable income is to people, depending on how much of it they already have, um, you know, giving money to people who have 100 times less of it is like 100 times as good. And so that's kind of our our baseline concept of 100x ROI. It's, it's like a you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's a value a hundred times as good as giving a dollar to a random American um, for every dollar that we spend. And then usually, you know, for, for give well top charities, we think those tend to be more like a thousand X ROI. So 10 X as good as give directly. Um, and that's based on give well's cost effectiveness calculations uh, that are kind of going off of, you know, health benefits and how much uh, people would pay for those health benefits if they could, for example. Um, and so you already have, you know, it's already can be kind of tricky to start comparing even things like bed nets to cash transfers because you have health benefits versus financial benefits. And there's a, you know, there's a variety of methods for comparing, comparing those and getting them all into one benchmark so that you can start to decide where you want to allocate the money. Um, but where things get really tricky are a couple of particular questions that, uh, that we found particularly just like difficult to deal with. So one of them is, you know, we've got this farm animal welfare work that's incredibly, has been incredibly successful and has resulted in a lot of farm animals being treated better. Um, and, and there's this question of when you, you know, for example, when you help, uh, when you help a certain number of chickens be not in cages anymore, how, what is the ROI of that? Like, how do you compare that to helping humans? Um, and there's this, there's this odd scenario, this odd situation where uh, if you basically, if you value you know, you, you can kind of ask yourself, I mean, would I rather help one human or 20 chickens? Would I rather help one human or 100 chickens, one human or 1,000 chickens? And it's like, for some answers, um, it will imply that you should spend all your money on farm animal welfare and none of it on helping humans today. Um, and for other answers, it will imply that you should only help humans and you shouldn't do anything to help chickens. Um, and our, our basic take is that that, you know, that sort of uh, situation, um, we, there are certain questions that we find thorny enough and hard enough to answer and hard enough to get a confident view on that we actually just end up splitting the difference anyway, even though there's, there's sort of no rigorous mathematical justification for doing this. Um, but there are a number of reasons that we don't want to be a foundation that's either completely ignoring farm animal welfare or just a farm animal welfare foundation. Um, we believe that, you know, building capacity to work in a lot of different causes is going to be better for our long-term uh, option value, our long-term ability to do different things as we change our minds. Um, we also just, you know, we, we think that, uh, we think there's some, some kind of philosophical cases for when there's this much of a question mark about how to compare two things, um, splitting the difference a bit, and I won't go into that here. And then, you know, another one of these, another one of these big divides that's very hard is long-termism versus uh, versus kind of more normal philanthropy, which we're currently calling near-termism, although we're looking to rename it. Um, but it's like, you know, you can, you can make this argument that if you reduce the odds of uh, humanity going extinct or something by 1%, um, that that's worth kind of this enormous, enormous, enormous number of lives saved equivalent because you're helping all the future generations. And so if you take that seriously, it says you should only spend money on long-termism. Um, and that's another place where we've kind of said, you know, there's a split here because long-termist giving tends to be idiosyncratic in a bunch of ways. It tends not to have very good feedback loops. Um, it tends to be the kind of thing where we're kind of, we're spending money on AI research, but we don't have any real way of checking how it's going or of getting a reality check or of understanding whether we've had a win. Um, and so we don't want to be a foundation that's just all long-termist. Um, and so, you know, again, we have these kind of splits um, and, and we'll have, 
you know, we'll, we'll, we'll basically say we're putting a certain amount of money into maximizing good accomplished by long-termist metrics and a certain amount of money into maximizing good accomplished by near-termist metrics. Um, and then within, within those kind of allocations, we, tr we might try to optimize a little bit more. So that is, uh, you know, that is a, a tough thing about doing philanthropy like this is you run into these really daunting questions and you either, you know, you can either go all in on one kind of giving or you can kind of do this unprincipled worldview diversification thing where you split the difference a little bit. And right now we're in, we're in a split the difference kind of place. And, you know, maybe 30 years from now when we've done a ton of research and have much more confident views, that may change. Who knows? Yeah. Thanks for sharing. You know, it sounds like there are a lot of different ways to, to, to compare across causes and um, different mechanisms to, to, to be looking at ROI, depending upon which of these worldviews you take. I, I'm wondering if we could actually dive to a, a, a more concrete um, level for a moment here and think about it from not just the cause level, but the grant level. And if we zoom in, what, do you have some examples of some grants that OpenPhil has made that you are particularly proud of? Uh, yeah, I mean, there. I'm, I'm happy to go through some of those. Um, I, I've mentioned the farm animal welfare work. I think that's been, you know, just in terms of tangible making a difference in terms of wins. I think that's been some of the remarkable work that Open Philanthropy has done. Uh, so, you know, when when we started, there was definitely already momentum, and I, I don't want to be saying that you know that this was all because of Open Philanthropy support or anything like that. And the vast majority of the work is definitely done by the grantees, not us. Um, but we did, you know, we got into farm animal welfare and started really funding and beefing up these advocacy groups that advocate for animals to be treated better. Um, and, you know, fairly shortly after we came in, uh, you know, basically uh, essentially every fast food uh, company and grocer in the U.S. had made a cage-free pledge. Um, and since then, we've kind of, we've been supporting international groups in Europe, in South America, in Japan. Um, and we've also been moving beyond cage-free and talking about broiler chicken welfare um, and, you know, starting on, on fish welfare and things like that. And um, just there's, there's just a steady drumbeat of these corporate pledges uh, to treat animals better that we think is often attributable to our grantees, um, who I think would, would be still getting a lot of this impact if we didn't exist. Um, but we believe they're moving faster, they're moving more confidently, they're doing a lot more because of the fact that we've really funded them, we've encouraged them to expand. Um, and so I think, you know, every time we look back on our farm animal welfare work and we tally up, you know, what, what we think has happened, it's always very impressive. There's a high pace of wins. Um, this is a place where I feel like the world is changing, suffering is falling. Um, and, you know, I do think our, our funding is playing a role. I, I don't, want, don't want to say the funding is the main reason. I think the group's the work being done by the farm animal welfare groups is the main reason, uh, but we are, we are supporting them. Um, and so that's, you know, that's an example, um, you know, I think to, to give a, you know, a human centric near termist example, um, there's a cause that we've been interested in for years called macroeconomic stabilization policy. Um, this is kind of a, a somewhat wonky, obscure area. Uh, basically there's, you know, there's this question of, uh, how to how to set interest rates um, and how to how to kind of make certain economic decisions uh, to manage a trade off uh, between employment and inflation. And so basically, you know, um, when there's a recession, you can sort of fight the re recession more aggressively or less aggressively. Uh, when you fight it more aggressively, that means that uh, the the uh, the money supply is higher. And there tends to be less unemployment, but maybe more risk of inflation. Uh, when you fight a recession less aggressively, you have less risk of inflation, and usually the recession is deeper. Um, and we kind of came into this cause years ago, and we said, you know, this is a kind of a strange, wonky cause that I've probably not done a great job explaining just now because it because there's a lot to it. Um, but it's actually one of the most important determinants of quality of life and employment and economic prospects, uh, especially for the working class in a given country. And America is where we focus because it's where we've seen just like where, where we've had the network and the ability to do things. Um, and so, you know, we, we kind of came in here and we, we've been funding groups like Fed Up campaign at the Center for Popular Democracy um, and more recently Employ Employment America, which is a think tank that makes the case for, you know, basically saying, we, we need to consider unemployment to be a real huge problem. And 
we need to think a little bit differently about how historically we've weighed the trade-off between unemployment and inflation, that basically it's okay to risk a little more inflation um, in order to get a big cut in unemployment because of the massive human damage that unemployment does um, and because of how, how many benefits there are to kind of a stronger economy. Um, that's something we came into years ago. And, and I would say in general that, you know, there has been movement on this. I, I, there, I think the US policymakers are, are, have moved much more in the direction that we're talking about than they were five years ago. And I think you can see it in the way that the, um, the, the stimulus has been done, uh, the, the recent coronavirus stimulus, um, and also just in the behaviors of the Federal Reserve, which is setting interest rates and kind of determining how it wants to approach this trade-off. And I think there's a lot of reasons that shift has happened. And I don't want to, you know, again, don't want to say this is because of open philanthropy. It's certainly not. There's a lot going on. But we have supported um, some of the main groups making the case for rethinking how this goes. We do think there have been some some tangible, you know, relevant mini episodes where we believe our grantees have made a difference. Um, and we believe that's a case where, you know, the economy is is probably stronger and unemployment is lower than it would be otherwise. And we're still not seeing, you know, big inflation problems. And we believe that, you know, it's hard to say there's a lot of moving pieces, but there may be a role for open philanthropy in that story. Um, Finally, just on the long term side, uh, you know, I would say, you know, in terms of in terms of reducing global catastrophic risks and things like that, um, I'm I'm very proud of our work supporting the Center for Security and Emerging Technologies. That's a think tank in Washington D.C. that provides kind of rigorous analysis to policymakers about. AI and and other emerging technologies, and we've just we're really we're really happy with the the quality of the work, the quality of the analysis. Often helping educate people about misconceptions, uh, for example, misconceptions about how much China is spending on AI and how vital it is for the U.S. to catch up with them. Um, and you know, we think that's been just a, an influential group doing high quality analysis that has has also helped some effective altruists kind of get into government where they can hopefully make a big difference. Um, and yeah. so we just had an opportunity to talk about some of the, the sort of success stories of some of Open Phil's grant making. And I was wor uh, wondering if you could also share a little bit about the, the sort of other side of the equation of successes, which is, you know, mistakes um, and maybe some lessons we've learned, some problems we've encountered over the past uh, years and how um, things you may have changed your mind on or updated on accordingly. Yeah. Uh, so I make tons of mistakes every day um, and, you know, could probably talk with you about them for the whole interview. Um, I'm just going to focus on one that I think has been really important and uh, and really kind of central for the open philanthropy experience over the last few years. Uh, you know, a lot of what open Phil works on is what, what I've kind of, you know, started calling, and it's not my term, but I've started calling it wicked problems. Um, and a wicked problem is, is a problem you're trying to solve that, uh, kind of the shape of the problem is not stable. So you're, you're asking a question like, when should we expect transformative AI to be developed? And I can ask that question and I could, you know, ask, ask someone as an employee to work on that question, but neither of us really, you know, when, when we first start asking that question, neither of us knows exactly what that means. Um, and we haven't fully defined the question. We haven't fully defined the workflow for answering the question. Um, we don't really have necessarily much of a plan for answering it. And, you know, when, when, uh, when Ellie Hassenfeld and I started GiveWell, we were working on wicked questions like this that were kind of like, what's the best charity? And we didn't really know what we meant by that. Um, and so what would happen in the early days of GiveWell is Ellie and I would just, we would try something, we would change gears, we would try something else, we would change gears. Um, and it was just very improvisational. And we had to try a million things and go in a million directions before we really ended up doing something right. And what happens when you try to take a question like that and build a team around it is it's very hard to provide uh, like what I would call effective training, effective management, mentoring, support. It's very hard to provide that, or or maybe it's easy and we haven't figured out how to do it. Um, but certainly, you know, again, in the in the early days of GiveWell, it was like Ellie and me just improvising, talking every five minutes. Um, when you have a slightly larger organization and you're trying to kind of systematically train people, that the target is moving too fast, and you know you kind of keep changing your mind about how much depth you want to do on each sub question, what kinds of methodologies you want to use, what kinds of things you want to review, what framework you're using. And it can be very disorienting um, and just very hard to, to, to help someone succeed at that work when you're in kind of a manager employee relationship. Um, and so I think in the, in the past, we've sometimes just, we've tried to hire people to work on problems where we have not ourselves 
really define so well what the problems are, how we want them addressed, what the process is, how we're going to get there. And as a result, um, I think sometimes we just have not provided the support, the mentorship, the training that we wanted to provide. And people have, you know, in some cases had bad experiences um, in, in a way that I think was has been really unfortunate. Um, I think in many cases, we would have been better off sticking with a smaller experienced team of people who had been, you know, kind of working together for a long time, knew each other, knew how to improvise, um, and then get to the point where we've done the work for a while, we understand the shape of the work, we understand how to train and support people. Um, and it's a hard trade-off because we really, open philanthropy really wants to move fast and we really want to do as much as we can. You know, every, every time we don't make a hire, every time we don't do a, a project, that's something, some value we left on the table, especially given that we, we have the funds to do things now, to hire people to do projects. But, you know, we've also learned that I think hiring people when you don't, when you aren't ready to provide the training and support they need and expect is a really bad idea. Um, we're still continuing to learn about that trade-off. We're still trying to do things to uh, to make the trade-off less acute. So, you know, have better onboarding, have better mentorship, have better uh, general support, team building efforts, so that, you know, these kind of adjustments to these disorienting problems are easier to handle. And, and it's, it's something you can do with a, with a bigger team than you could otherwise. But I think we have not gotten rid of that trade-off. And I think it's a, it's a huge challenge to look at the work you need to do and ask yourself honestly, you know, is this work ready to hire people in and scale it up? Or does this work need more more of us just sitting with it and improvising it until it becomes more stable. Um, and I think that's something we have not, we have not always done well in the past and we're, we're still trying to get better at it. Yeah. I, I appreciate you taking the, the opportunity to take a look back there and talk us through some of those tough trade-offs and, and lessons learned. You know, now if, if we shift gears for a moment and talk a little bit more about a, a sort of future oriented lens, I, I'd also be curious, you know, if we think about the future of open philanthropy for the next couple of years, um, what, what are your sort of top organizational priorities? Yeah, um, so, you know, I think on the uh, on the long term side, or actually on both sides, I mean, we, we continue to be really intense about worldview investigations. These are these are hard to do. These are wicked problems, like I said, but they're very important. So we've uh, we've had a bunch of uh, content come out, and we have more coming out soon on this question of AI, what we call AI timelines, which means you know when can we expect transformative AI to be developed, and that shapes our strategy around potential risks for advanced AI, but it also shapes our general. Uh, our general view on other things about, you know, what will it take to do things that can help humanity at 10,000 or a million or more years from now. Um, so we have, you know, that th it kind of gets in there in a lot of ways, like when we're working on effective altruism community building, what are our priorities there and how do we want to do that? Um, when we work on other global catastrophic risks, how do they fit in? So it's important for us to have views, uh, in my opinion, it's important for us to have views on kind of are we likely to see transformative artificial intelligence this century? Are we likely to see it this decade? Um, things like that. We've had a bunch of content come out on that. Um, we also are now trying to put more effort into having a, a kind of more complete and rigorous understanding of what the risks are of transformative artificial intelligence. Like, you know, what, uh, what could go wrong? I know there's been a lot written on this, but we want to have kind of our our own considered take that considers everything that's been written on what could go wrong, how likely is it, how likely is work today to reduce risks of things that could go wrong, such as the alignment problem. Um, so that remains like a real high priority for us. There's also uh, worldview investigation questions like, you know, what are the spillovers between kind of rich country economies and poor country economies? So, you know, in other words, if you're choosing between work that can help the US economy, um, like scientific research or, um, you know, or macroeconomic stabilization or whatnot versus work that is more aimed at going directly to poor countries. Um, you know, which one is better depends somewhat on like whether there are spillovers from, from rich country growth to poor country growth. Um, so world investigations remains a priority. Uh, we want to grow giving a bunch on the near term side. Um, we believe that we can. We believe that we've learned a lot about how to identify these like highly cost-effective areas of near-termist giving. Um, we have this kind of hope and aspiration that we can find enough places to put money that will do even more good than give us top charities, but we don't know if that'll work out or not. And we want to aggressively start pursuing it. Um, and so we have this, you know, we have this hope of, of doing that. Um, and we're exploring right now, we're just doing a large number of investigations of, um, of different causes we could go into. Uh, these include things like, you know, 
air quality in South Asia. These include things like uh, policy advocacy for you know, uh, better, uh, better enforcement of tax policy in developing countries. Uh, they include like advocacy for more foreign aid, uh, scientific research aimed specifically at problems affecting the global poor. And you know, I think we have a major priority of exploring a lot of causes along that, that general line. Um, and then potentially hiring some more program officers and you know, getting a major scale up in the amount of money we're giving out and seeing if we can kind of beat that bar, um, you know, do, do even more good per dollar than give all top charities. And if we can't, uh, we'll likely increase the allocation to give all top charities. And uh, on the long-term side, you know, we're not looking to expand in the same way. I mean, we're obviously we'd be happy to spend more if we saw great opportunities, but I've described earlier uh, in this conversation, I've described how we, you know, we don't always have a lot of shovel ready things to do. So a lot of the priority on the long-term side is thinking about how we can kind of do proactive projects that increase the long-term supply of great grantees. Um, you know, example of this is a scholarship program we recently ran for kind of early career people who want to work on things that are that are good for the long-term future of humanity. Um, and there's this idea that if we give people scholarships now to kind of help them build their career, we'll have more great people to fund later. Um, we have a bunch of other ideas along those lines that could take us a lot of work and could be very proactive, where we're kind of designing programs um, that can help get us on track to have more things to fund in the future. Um, so those are kind of the, you know, those are some of the top grant making priorities at the moment. Yeah, the, thanks for sharing some of that, that uh, future perspective there. And we, we've actually had a, a, a couple of related questions come in, uh, I think both from the EA forum and from the, the live chat now. So I want to, to give the audience an opportunity to, to hear about it. Um, people from, from all over uh, uh, seem to be wondering um, how much work is sort of going into figuring out um, that rate of how quickly on a sort of year, yearly basis, OpenFill should be spending their money. Yeah, um, so there was a, a fairly major project uh, during, you know, during the last year or so that was trying to answer exactly that question. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, 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 hoping, we're hoping sometime this year to put out a public version of our analysis. Um, you know, it's it's the, there's a the 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 um, the desire to expand giving on the near term side is strong, and and the the person who's been doing that work is involved in that. And so I don't want to make promises about when it'll be out, but we're hoping to put it out. But um, you know, one of the one of the things that we've kind of seen from this, I think there have been times in my life when I thought, you know, heuristically, well, it's probably just better to spend faster. And there's been times when I thought heuristically, no, it's probably better to just really save. You make a good investment return every year. Um, and then you should only spend when you see really amazing stuff. Um, but the analysis we've done, I think, just really suggests that neither of those is the case. Um, it suggests this is actually just a really tough question uh, that has a lot of sensitivities in it. And, um, you know, our current feeling is that we should be spending probably more than we are right now uh, per year, but not like incredibly more. Um, and it's not worth it if you make big sacrifices to cost effectiveness. But there's there's a lot of kind of there's a lot of questions about kind of how fast do you expect giving opportunities to get better or worse? How fast does the quality of giving opportunities diminish uh, within a year? So you know how much how much better is your first hundred million than your next hundred million? Um, that relatively you know changing the answers to these questions can really matter to open fill. And so this is something we've put a fair amount of work into, and we want to put more work into. Um, so that, yeah, that, that is the case there. Yeah, and uh, uh, Holden, another component of that that the audience was uh, uh, interested in learning a little bit more about, um, you know, it, it, does, is OpenFill actively involved in like that, that sort of investment strategy uh, around this and figuring out, you know, how that relates to future giving? Yeah, historically, we have stuck to philanthropy. So, we, you know, we're helping advise um, high net worth people, especially Carrie and Dustin, on where to give, and we generally don't advise them on where to invest. Um, so it's, you know, it's up to them. They've got all this money they're not giving away yet. Uh, what kind of, you know, what investments do they want to make with it? That's historically just not been our area. Um, we're likely to do a bit more of that. I think we're not investment professionals. And so we're never going to say, you know, here's the best portfolio for maximizing your return. Um, but there are some things that are a little bit specific to altruistic goals that are kind of interesting. So there's, there's two kinds of concepts that we're interested in um, that we're going to look into a bit more. One of them is optimal altruistic leverage. So, you know, if, if what you're, uh, basically when you think about how much risk you want to take in your investment portfolio, um, it matters what you want to use your money for. So if you're, if you're a private individual, uh, you want to take a certain amount of risk. 
if all you're doing with the money is using it to help people, you may want to take a different amount of risk. And so it's thinking through that kind of thing. Um, what is the optimal amount of risk for us to be taking? That is, that is something we want to look at more um, and, and advise, uh, advise the people we work with on. And then there's another concept called mission hedging, um, which is this idea of, you know, basically trying to invest money so that you'll have more of it when you need more of it to do the most good. Um, and an obvious example would be, you know, if it turns out that transformative AI is developed sooner, then we want more money sooner. Um, you know, and uh, and and so we're we're interested in kind of these ideas of, you know, sort of betting in a sense, betting on transformative AI to be developed in a way that matches our timelines, um, means that we're more likely to have more money in worlds where we're more correct and where we have more opportunities to give it away. Um, and so those are things we're looking into. But in general, I mean, we're not an investment advisor. So, so these, are kind of, these are kind of philanthropic modifications on a standard portfolio or maybe on a non-standard one, but yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Holden. So I, I actually wanna take us to uh, another uh, question from the audience. And this one has us actually circling back to this idea of changing minds and lessons learned. And um, in particular, there was this EA forum post you made in 2017 called Some Thoughts on Public Discourse. I um, mean, I'll, I'll attempt to do a little bit of a summary here, but um, you express an appreciation for some forms of public discourse, but also seem to indicate that you had found sort of continual engagement with public discourse to be less beneficial and more costly than you once thought it would be when you started GiveWell. And uh, the audience is wondering here, does that view that you wrote about in 2017 still hold or have you updated again in a different direction? Um, yeah, it's, it's not not too far off uh, is the short answer, but I'll, I'll give a slightly longer answer. Um, you know, just, just to give a little history of my, my thinking on transparency and feedback and questioning yourself. I mean, Something, something that has always been true of me and, and remains as true of me today as ever um, is that I, you know, I feel a lot of self-skepticism and I, I feel like it's really easy to be wrong. And I feel that in order to get the best answer about where to put money, um, you want to really make serious efforts to take the most important things you believe and get feedback on them and get pushback for, on them and, and, and hear from people who disagree, who can help you see where you're wrong and change your mind. Um, you know, but my, my views on how to accomplish that have changed a lot. Um, I, I wouldn't say they've changed a ton since 2017 when I made that post, but they've changed a ton since we started GiveWell in 2007. Um, so, you know, in 2007, when Ellie and I started GiveWell, I had this kind of picture that, you know, the best way to get that kind of feedback and challenge and pushback was basically like put everything you're doing on the public web and read the comments. Um, and I think, I, I think that's a, a bit of a uh, people listening now are probably thinking that that sounds like a very 2007 way of thinking. And, and it was, um, you know, that's not a very 2021 way of thinking. Um, and, and I think most people have made kind of the same update I've made, uh, which is that this idea of, you know, throwing everything up on the web and reading the comments um, just doesn't look like an incredibly productive way to hear from people who are knowledgeable about what you're doing, who have good insights, who are going to change your mind. I think I think a lot of times, um, you know, you encounter sort of you encounter a lot of bad faith people, frankly, um, who then can make it, you know, make other people less wanting to engage with you. So in other words, if we talk to a charity um, and we get a bunch of information from them and then we put it on the web, that's exposing that charity to a bunch of stuff they don't want to be exposed to, makes them less open with us. And I think it can undermine our goal of really having frank, open conversations with the people who know the most about what we're doing. Um, and so, you know, where I've kind of evolved to is that now I believe that the best way to get pushback on your work is to really think about who you want giving feedback on it and really target them because putting stuff up on the web and reading the comments can be counterproductive. Um, to the goal of getting the people you most want giving pushback to engage with you, to trust you, to share their views, to give information. Um, and it can also just, you know, be the wrong use of time relative to things that are targeted at that. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it remains true that we want a lot of feedback and criticism on our core views. I think a good example is the, you know, the worldview investigation stuff where, um, you know, I think, I think what we've, where we've kind of come to is that we have these views on transformative AI that are very core to what we're doing. Um, and instead of, instead of kind of taking every grant that we make on AI and putting tons of information on the web and kind of overwhelming ourselves and everyone else with a volume of commentary that, 
you know, what would mostly, I think, consist of people just giving very quick reactions to things. Um, what we've done instead is we've tried to hone in what are the most important things we believe? What are the, the views that would be most important to challenge if they're wrong? And just pour an enormous amount of work into taking those from these kind of vague views that are expressed in conversations or private Google Docs and get them to be rigorously stated, you know, clear views that we're able to put out in public. So, you know, at this point, most of our reasoning about when we expect transformative AI and why, I mean, about half of it is public now and the other half will be public within a few months, I would say. Um, and that's been just like a huge, huge amount of work to just go from these informal views we have from talking to people and thinking about stuff to things that we can really put in one place and make it possible to get someone who really knows the area and is an expert and might bring a different perspective to understand what we're even saying in the first place and what our arguments are and then push back and give us that feedback. And so, you know, I would say our, our worldview investigations project is, is an example of where we put a really unusual and, and large amount of investment into activities that we think will help us change our minds and hear from the world, as well as helping us convince other people in the world to agree with us. It's, it's kind of both and either, um, you know, if we're right, we'd like more people to agree with us. If we're wrong, we'd like to change our minds. Um, that's an example of where the effort goes today that used to go into kind of taking every single thing and putting it online. Um, although, I mean, you know, GiveWell is still a very public facing organization um, and still kind of has this target audience of, of individual donors. And so they still tend to be heavily transparent about just about everything they do. But open philanthropy, I mean, our, we have a much more concentrated audience. We work with a small number of families that we know well. Um, and so we don't have that same goal, but we still want pushback on the most important things we believe. Yes, thanks for sharing that, Holden. Um, with some of our, our, our last remaining time, I, I want to see if we can sneak in a couple more uh, questions from the audience. Uh, and so one question was, what are some of the common misconceptions EAs have about open fill grant making? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not totally sure how to answer this one because I don't know what the conceptions are in the first place. Uh, and I, it really depends who you're talking to. And, you know, everyone has different conceptions. Um, I'll just throw out something that, that has seemed to me at times that people, you know, sometimes seem to kind of kind of model open philanthropy as this like single unified agent with a utility function um, where it's like everything we do is like the, 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 the decision of one unified entity that is, you know, making one consistent set of decisions. And we're, we're deliberately not set up that way. Um, a lot of open philanthropy is about taking big risks and giving yourself a chance to do something special and being okay with striking out a lot of the time. And so a lot of our process is about dividing people into teams and minimizing veto points and letting different teams try different things and make different bets. Um, and so, you know, a, a lot of what we try to do is minimize friction and allow the, you know, the kind of most expert, most trusted people at Open Philanthropy to try things that, that don't have to agree with everyone at the org, including in many cases myself, we have a lot of, you know, a lot of different ways that program officers can kind of gr get grants past me without me totally agreeing. Um, and so I think sometimes, you know, people will read into a grant or a set of grants as, you know, open philanthropy has endorsed this organization. And, and relatedly, sometimes people will think, well, open philanthropy must do like, you know, thousands of hours of research on, on every grant they make. And, you know, they'll, they'll see it as this much bigger of a statement than it is. A lot of times when you look at our grant database, what you're really seeing is like, someone wanted to try this. Someone else wanted to try that. Someone else wanted to try that. Um, and that's all that's going on. So I think I think that that is a misconception that I that I sometimes feel people have. Great. Um, and, and now uh, uh, shifting gears a little bit, I, I wanted to actually take it uh, on a bit more of a personal level um, in you and your background. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, your journey to becoming uh, the the CEO of Open Philanthropy it didn't involve much formal education, in particular um, effective altruist causes. And you don't have an advanced degree in economics, development economics, or you know, artificial intelligence, for example. Um, are there things you can share with the audience about how you ended up where you are? And was there a, a particular mindset or approach that you used to build up the skill set you needed to be successful? Um, I mean, my story is a pretty standard entrepreneur story. So back in you know, 2004, 2007, my co-founder Ellie and I were trying to give to charity. We wanted a website that would tell us which charity to give to to help the most people. The website didn't exist, so we set out to build it. 
that's just, you know, that's the standard entrepreneur story. And, um, you know, we did do a lot of self-education. So I would read a lot of academic papers. Then I would read papers about papers. I would read blog posts about papers. I would try to understand, you know, what, what is going on in these papers? What are the mathematical assumptions? What are the underlying statistics? What could be misleading um, and get used to that? But, um, you know, I, I never developed, I mean, I, I've never developed a PhD worth of expertise in anything. Um, I've always kind of, you know, learned things well enough that I can position myself to start hiring and managing people who know more, more, a lot more about it than I do and who dig into things. Um, also a lot of, you know, I, I do feel a lot of effective philanthropy work just doesn't fit neatly into any field. And so it's often helpful to be, you know, for example, for, for GiveWell's work um, on, you know, reducing global poverty, it can be helpful to be familiar with like econom econometrics, um, but you need to be familiar with a lot of other things too. And you don't need to be a world expert on econometrics. You don't need to be someone who could you know, publish an original insight that changes the way everyone does econometrics. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would generally just say I've actually followed, in my view, I followed like kind of just a standard entrepreneur track um, and have never really built up, you know, I've never really built up PhD level expertise and, and my job doesn't require it. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's basically my answer there. Yeah. Um, and then maybe with our, our last few minutes, there, there's a couple uh, of other questions coming from the audience. People are interested in learning more about um, careers and advice you might have. Um, in particular, you know, when you're thinking about what you've seen in your career or those of other EAs, do you have thoughts on how your advice might differ from that of 80,000 hours? Um, it's, it's pretty hard to answer this question. Uh, I think both 80,000 hours and I think it's like very hard to give general audience career advice. Um, so you can, you know, you can help people become aware of new considerations. You can help them see what, you know, what the interesting causes are. Um, you know, I believe that that career choice is just very individual thing, and and it's hard to really give someone a flow chart. Um, I am I am working on a piece for the probably the Effective Altruism Forum that probably in the next few months I'll put out there that does have some of my thoughts on long termist career choice because um, I think that's a particularly kind of thorny problem and and the question of like, hey, I'm a early career talented person, uh, I want to do long-termist work, what do I do? Because there's so few organizations um, and, you know, may not get a job at any of them. What do I do? Um, I think it's an interesting question and I'm going to put some thoughts out on it, um, but I, I don't think it's easy to summarize those now. I, I would say that I, you know, when I'm giving, when I'm talking to people about their career, I mean, uh, people are often in the, in the EA community, people are often surprised by how much I'm telling people to kind of do things you're you know, especially early career, do things you're excited about that you think are going to help you grow, where you're going to be surrounded by great people, where you're going to be getting better at something, um, and really put a lot more weight on that. I think I, I almost never, it's like people come to me, sometimes they'll say, well, I'm really excited about this job, and I think it'd be really great for me, and I'd get better at what I want to get better at, but this other job, you know, I, I kind of ran a calculation and I think it's more impact. And I, I just, I, I basically just never go for the second one. Um, I just think these calculations, they're, they're not robust. They're too noisy. Um, careers are hard to predict. They have lots of twists and turns. And I, I think it's, it's better to be improving your ability to have great options in the future. Um, and that means generally just like getting good at something you think you could be good at and could like really sustainably be incredibly obsessed with, which is often what it takes to be good at something. Um, so I, I usually nudge people in that direction, but um, yeah, but I, I think that's, that's, that's mostly that. And I don't, I, I think it's hard to say a lot more than that. Great. Thanks, Holden. Well, we, we have just over a minute left and I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can sneak in, you know, maybe we can get a quick soundbite from you. Um, do you have any advice for people who are a part of the effective altruist community at how they can better take, um, seek and make use of advice? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I generally feel like advice is overrated. Um, you know, I mean, I, uh, I when I say advice, I mean like you're talking to someone who doesn't know that much about you, doesn't know about that much about your situation. Um, they're not like an expert on some sub question. You're like getting general life lessons from someone, or, or they're thinking for like an hour about what your situation is and trying to help you. Um, and I, you know, I think sometimes that kind of thing can raise new ideas and new considerations. Um, but I, I think it's, 
you know, in general, I think the best way to accomplish things is to pick a goal and throw yourself into it and accumulate a ton of little lessons and reach the point where you know more about some small slice of the world than anyone else possibly could. Um, and I think for careers, you know, you're going to know more about things like, am I thriving? Am I growing? What, what can I see myself being really good at? What can I see myself being really obsessed with? Um, where could I see myself becoming like someone who has more options and more abilities? And it's just hard for someone advising you to see that whole picture. Um, so, you know, I, I guess my advice on advice is just to, just to not, not take advice too seriously and, and try to find ways to operate in the world that don't rely very much on it, which, which I guess means don't listen to what I just said, um, which maybe is a good way to wrap this up. <laughs> well, well yeah. on that uh, uh, resounding final note, um, thank you Holden, <laughs> yeah. for taking the time to, to, to talk with us today. And thank you to all of uh, you in the audience for, for joining us as well. Cool. Thanks.